Hello and welcome to the Linux Lads, episode 126. As usual, I'm Shane and I'm only joined by Connor this week. Little old me. Yeah, uh, unfortunately Amelith has uh, COVID, so uh, get well soon and Mike is moving house, so he's very, very busy. But we have a special guest this week. We are joined by Liam Proven of The Register. How are you, Liam? Hello, how are you doing? I'm very well and very happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah, you're very welcome along. We have uh, met before briefly at the Ubuntu Summit and uh, during many nights that uh, are a bit hazy, I I would assume. (laughs) I can see your Ubuntu Summit bag hanging on the door behind you there and I'm I'm That's wishing I'd got my unintentional. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was the Prague one, was it? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's the that's the Charles Bridge on the bag there, and you can actually also see in the mirror reflection here my uh, Ubuntu Summit badges hanging up oh, off my desk. Very nice too. Yeah, so they're all hanging up there, little keepsakes. Um, so we'll dive into some questions, I guess. Um, for those that may not know about you or the Register, Liam, can you just give us a rundown of w- what it is and what what you do there? Well, uh, okay, so 30 years of history in a minute. Um, the Reg <laughs> is a originally mainly British, but these days equally American and indeed global computer news website. It started out as an email newsletter in about 1996, went onto the web a couple of years later, and has been going ever since. It's still an independent site. Uh, we have sister sites, dev class, blocks and files, and the next platform. We are nominally based, or at least nominally I'm based out of London, but actually I, I work from home these days in Douglas in the Isle of Man. But previously I was based in Prague in the Czech Republic. I've been freelancing for the register for about 15 years now, since um, I worked at Heiser, the German tech publisher. But I've been working for them full time since the end of 2021, and my remit is open source, Linux, and to a lesser extent, public cloud and sort of alternate technology and so on, but with a general interest in things like obscure and historical operating systems, programming languages, platforms, and things like that. Okay, brilliant. Very concise. I love it. So your own personal journey with Linux and open source, uh, what what was that like? How did you first get into all of this? Gosh, um, so I guess, you know, it's there's probably a, a generational thing that quite a few people went through because I'm, I'm 56 now. My first job, which was, which was here on the Isle of Man, uh, we put in quite a lot of boxes running uh, SCO Xenix, which was a very early commercial Unix for x86 hardware. It was co-developed with Microsoft in its very early days, but Microsoft, with DOS being a growing success, decided to let their development partners own it and run it. So there were businesses all around the Isle of Man running multi-user account systems on a 386 with 2 to 4 meg of RAM and a bunch of dumb terminals. And I got to put in a whole load of those machines and fix them when they went wrong. And later on, with the rise of networks, I got them talking to PCs and doing file transfer to PCs and stuff like that. So, yeah, I was using Unix in the very late 80s. um, But at that time, it was not really a system that you could experiment or explore with very much. The basic SCO system, you got the operating system text only. And that was about it. Networking cost extra. If you wanted a graphical interface, that cost extra. If you wanted a C compiler, that cost extra. So if you wanted to build a, a like a desktop operating system, you could do that, but it would cost you about £2,000 per person in license fees. So nobody did. Blimey. That'll be a lot even now. And I can't even imagine that in the 80s. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, and you know, you probably needed like a 5000 pound computer or something to run it on so it it was amenable to being a a standalone system but very few people could afford to use it for that so that there were cheap commercial systems around there was one i i looked at the adverts in the computer magazines called coherent which i liked the sound of coherent was just 99 us dollars and there was a famous story that was so similar to and so compatible with at&t's commercial unix at&t didn't believe the company's 
claims that it was independently built. If some of your listeners might not know the name Coherent, but they might remember the name of the activist Aaron Schwartz, who very sadly killed himself a few years ago, a digital rights activist. His dad set up and run the company that produced Coherent, the Mark Williams company. Mm. And the way that AT&T verified it was safe is they sent Dennis Ritchie to their offices and told him, look at the code and check none of it's yours. Mm. Dennis Ritchie, as in Thompson and Ritchie, that wrote Unix. And he went Mm. to their offices and spent a day there and he looked at their source code. And he came away and said, nope, nope, they've done this completely from scratch. I can't believe it, but they really have. But you know what? A hundred quid euro dollars was still too much for me to pay as a, as a curious hobbyist, frankly, and work weren't going to pay. So in about 95, I got a work internet connection, only on dial-up, but I got a work internet connection and got to start reading about Linux but it was too big to realistically download. Um, for a start, you know, uh, I couldn't have really done it in a working day and would have had to leave my PC doing nothing else all day. Um, but it got me into the situation where occasionally, you know, demo and evaluation discs started coming past, and I got a distro called Laser Moon Linux FT. It was one of the first ever live CDs, and I booted it on my PC at work which was a Pentium, an all SCSI storage system. It had no IDE in it anyway. I was very proud of that at the time. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you know, I put the CD in and waited about 15, 20 minutes. And I had a graphical desktop and I had a web browser and it woke up my network card and looked for other TCP IP machines on the network. And there weren't any because it was a combined Windows and Mac network. So everything spoke Apple Talk or NetBuoy. There were no other TCP IP, machine, TCP IP boxes on the network. And I went, this is really impressive, but there's nothing I can do with it. You know, Mm -hmm. it's very nice, but I can't do my job with it. I was a writer and an editor. I needed to mostly work with Microsoft Word files, fetch them off a network share, or save them onto a network share, edit them, check them. And it couldn't do that. I installed it on my hard disk. I was never brave enough to put a bootloader on it. But I had no actual use for the thing. I just went, this is really impressive because it's completely free and it does what SEO would still have been happy to take about 2,000 euros off me at that point, if the euro had existed yet. Um, (laughs) So a couple of years later, a friend gave me an old Spark station, a little Sun workstation, and it had a very elderly version of Solaris on it, and I didn't have the root password. So I bought some Red Hat CDs, and I put Red Hat Linux on it. Mm-hmm. got it working went okay this is quite nice i don't really have any use for it but you know it, it works it does the job that was red hat 4.2 that's not red hat enterprise linux it's before they'd thought of that it was red hat linux 4.2 kernel panicked about once every five to ten minutes it was not very reliable <laughs> no. in those days sounds about right but spark was was also a bit of an experimental platform for linux in the mid late 90s i think the first one I installed for myself was Caldera Open Linux. Caldera was an offshoot of Novell, and Novell at one point planned to try and go up against Microsoft in the desktop operating system market. And what they did was they sponsored a Linux company to build a complete graphical desktop with all of the standard tools you'd have on a, on a Windows box, so an office suite, email, web browser, chat, a network client, because Novell. But because Novell, they had a press department, which virtually no other Linux company did then. So they invited me to a press conference and I went and had a look and went, this looks very nice. Can I have a go? And they went, yeah, sure. We'll send you a CD. And a box Mm -hmm. came in the post. And at that point, I was still on dial-up at home. I'd been on dial-up for five, six years, but I wasn't about to download a CD at 40 kilobits per second, you know. Forgive me for interrupting briefly, but just uh, Novell, I, I have something in the back of my mind that they had some sort of connection with SUSE. Did they own SUSE at some stage or were they? So the brief history was Novell sponsored Caldera to develop a Linux distro. They decided, you know what, we need Microsoft to like us and not hate us. And so they span off Caldera. Caldera bought SCO, SCO. Mm-hmm. renamed themselves the SCO Group and proceeded to sue all of their own customers and most of the Linux industry for stealing the code of their PC Unix. Dick move. 
The big mistake they really made is they sued IBM. IBM have lots and lots of lawyers and bottomless pockets. I imagine so. The case is still rumbling on in distant corners, although they've comprehensively lost it now. But after this disastrous effort with their first attempt at a Linux distro, a few years later in the 21st century, in about, I think, about 20 years ago, about 2003, 2004, Novell got bought by one of its own consultancies, Cambridge Technology Partners, I think. They bought Attachmate, who did software to attach PCs to mainframes as terminals, and Attachmate bought Novell. So they kind of ended up under the same ownership. And Novell didn't really know what to do, but they had the money to buy some leading Linux companies. They bought a company called Zimian, who wrote quite a lot of GNOME. And they wrote the GNOME file manager, Nautilus, for example. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. They, I think yeah. they wrote the Evolution email client as well originally, if I remember rightly. And so SUSE found themselves forcibly merged with a GNOME company, SUSE being the number one KDE distro. Hmm. Um, it didn't go very well. Suffice to say, if you buy SUSE Linux Enterprise SLE these days, it only comes with one desktop, and that is GNOME. KDE is not an option. It's not in the repos. But OpenSUSE still supports KDE as a first-class citizen, obviously. But mm. um, but yes, so Novell kind of had two different independent forays into Linux. First with Caldera, which was a very good product, but the company bought Sco, went mad, and you know tried to sue the whole industry. And Novell was nothing to do with that, and didn't want to be anything to do with that. And it later on bought bought SUSE. Mm. And the, the current rumblings in relation to the SUSE and versus and the OpenSUSE project is um, SUSE are uh, heavily suggesting that OpenSUSE changed their name. That's it's, right. I, yeah. I've i tried to dig into this. You know what? It's it's a source of real sadness to me. I, I worked for SUSE for four years. I really liked it. It's the most enjoyable and longest job I think I've ever had. But they do not like to deal with me as a journalist. And... <laughs> They invite my colleagues to events rather than me, and it's quite hard to get solid tech info out of them, and it's really disappointing. I mean, to be fair, it's also hard to get solid tech info out of Ubuntu and Red Hat. Anybody with a corporate presence, they've got legions of people who will talk to you about leveraging your synergies and maximizing the value of your investment. And when you ask them what shell they use, they look at you blankly and go, what's a shell? I don't want to leverage my synergies. I want to know what C library you're using and why you've chosen to compile with GCC 11 when there's more optimizations in 12. Or what's your attitude to Rust? And they go, uh, bad, paint it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's desperate. It's, it's really bad. It took me a year to get Canonical to give me anybody to talk to about landscape, their fleet management tool. They did in the end, and I got a private demo and it was very good. I haven't decided what or how to write about that just yet, but I'm still trying to get Red Hat and Sousa to talk to me about what you get for your subscription and what they include. And maybe let me talk to some customers about this because they're not expecting stuff like this. What they're expecting is how many seats what's your service level agreement going to be? What's the guaranteed response time? How many calls will you get bundled? And not, you know, how do you cope with a patch which needs to be rolled back? You know, the, the marketing people don't know the technical stuff and the technical people aren't allowed to talk to the press. It's quite frustrating. If there's any anybody from any of the big corporate Unix, Linux vendors listening, sort it out, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you you do us a lot of credit with <laughs> expecting that somebody from corporate Red Hat is going to be listening to this podcast, but you never know. You never know. There's there's you know there's a lot of Red Hatters out there. I was a Red Hatter briefly myself. I I worked there for a couple of months. That's why I moved to the Czech Republic. Didn't didn't work out. I did not fit with their corporate culture very well. So you've shared quite a bit of uh, interesting knowledge and a bit of your journey through, which is a fascinating history. The flip side of that, rather than history, how do you stay up to date with the latest news or the latest insights? I suppose the answer is really not very helpfully. I read a lot. I'm a speed reader and have been since childhood. 
I'm not as quick as I was. When I was a kid, I could read up to about 3,000 words a minute wow. and could mm. do a novel in half an hour. Jesus. That was, Jesus. you know, flat out on a fairly thin novel. I think these days probably 1,000 words a minute or something. But that's still about five times normal human speech, which is why this is the first time I've ever been on a podcast because I've, I've never listened to a podcast in my life because – Speech is too slow for me. <laughs> There's a large American uh, computer company with a Solaris-based product that I would love to write about, and they've even invited me onto a call at five in the morning my time because they're in Silicon Valley. But all of the materials they share are videos and and sound recordings, and I can't work with that. I read a lot. A couple of months ago, I did an obituary for Dave. Mills, I believe. I really hope I got the name right. He's the guy that wrote NTP, the network time protocol that all computers on the internet use to keep their clock synchronized. Mm -hmm. And he had a very interesting life history because he was born partially sighted and had very limited vision in one eye only. And apparently was a really quite lazy school kid who just liked to play with model trains and didn't study and one of his teachers said, you'll never amount to anything and you should stop pretending and just go home and play with your trains. And I think that might be what Terry Pratchett called headology because it really worked on the on the young lad. He, he suddenly took this as a challenge, uh, ended up going to university, getting a degree, then getting a doctorate and being a much venerated coder. And I'm I'm very ashamed to say that when he died, it was at the end of a week, and I hadn't heard of him and wasn't aware of his contributions to the industry. I'm pretty old, but he was before my time. You know, he was he was literally like a generation before me. He was in his mid 80s when he died. I think I watched the number of people mourning on Hacker News and Lobsters and and various other and Reddit and other tech communities over the weekend. And on Monday, I said to the editor, you know what, this guy was a really big deal and really pretty much universally loved. And I think we need to do an obituary. And my boss said, OK. And that meant I had to read everything public I could find about him that morning. I think I read thirty to 40,000 words over about the next three hours. That's a modest book. Yeah. And wow. then I had enough info to write a reasonably informed obituary. And then I had to go and have a little, little bit of a lie down and a cup of tea and then I had to come back with another <laughs> article that afternoon. So yeah, the, the secret is, is being willing to read vast amounts of text. And I'm afraid I don't really do YouTube at all. I've got one or two videos on YouTube, which I didn't put there because I've done a few conference talks and things like that. And I, I did some radio tech stuff in the 90s but it was pre-youtube pre-broadband so i guess that's that's all lost now sadly what immediately strikes me is just um hear, hearing you talk about that is it not just your uh, incredible ability to be able to uh, read a vast amount of information but you also have to process it you have to it's about time man well it's not it's organization skills i was going to say time management time management comes into it a bit but it's okay i i now have this vast amount of information that I've, I've now read like how do i i think you know everybody's got different methods and and some of my colleagues are really good at talking to people in in some of the big companies and quizzing them and cross-examining them and, and working out what they didn't want to say and what they didn't mean to say. And I'm not so good at that. That's not my strength. I, I, another, I guess, a kind of more difficult part of it is, yes, you have to read and absorb and, and, and make lots of notes, but then let it go again. I, you know, you can't keep all of this stuff. But I, I'm not very active on Ask Ubuntu or Stack Overflow or, or Reddit or, or most of the sites, but I'm quite active on Quora, which is a deadly site because it's it. what they've done is they've crowdsourced XKCD number 387. Somebody is wrong on the internet <laughs> at cloud scale. There's always somebody wrong on Quora, and I've got a terrible weakness for wanting to explain why. And and it just <laughs> amazes me. It's like, you know, I had some guy arguing with me on, 
on Facebook in a vintage computer forum a few months ago, and he's going, you know, well, you need to plug your floppy drive into your IDE connector and set it as master. And I went, no, you don't do that with floppies. Yes, you do. No, you don't. Floppies plug into your floppy controller. IDE controllers are for hard disks and compact disks, optical drives, and very occasionally things like the drive. Don't you dare tell me. Well, you're wrong. No, I'm not. It absolutely goes into IDE. No, it doesn't. You try. It's got a different number of pins. It won't go in. How dare you? And people just don't remember. And sadly, I am cursed with quite a retentive memory for, for professional stuff. Um, and then I've got a smartphone for telling me when my wife's birthday is, you know, but, uh, but, but, um, <laughs> um, a lot of what goes in has, I have to let it go out again. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's not fail safe, but you, you probably can't read it, but and it's also backwards. I've got a t-shirt on that says, uh, Nesem cactus, Musim Pete, your co-host could, uh, could translate that for you. But, um, I've been studying the Czech language for nine years now. Because I lived out there, my wife is Czech, and I'd really like to be able to talk to my mother-in-law and father-in-law, but they don't speak anything but Czech. So when I was when I was 20, when my dad died, my mum and I went from here on the Isle of Man to Germany on holiday by bus. It took three days. Wow. Two ferry crossings, and I bought a book called Linkword German, and I had my cheap knockoff Sonny Walkman and a couple of spare packets of batteries. And I read the book cover to cover on the bus. And when I got off the bus, I spoke German. And uh, mein Deutsch ist sehr schlecht, aber es es fungiert und uh, es ist für meine Ferien genug. Um, You know, three... So good. Yeah, danke schön. (laughs) Uh, 30 30 years ago, you know, but but three days of hard work and it stuck. And that's been a very, very useful professional skill. Um, I can't say that all of those novels I consumed in, in half an hour as a teenager stuck, but that's how I first read Mission of Gravity by Hal Clement, and that was a fantastic book. <laughs> my 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 partner would be kicking me now to take notes right now because uh, I've been with her for over six years, and she's French, and uh, she can she consistently annoys me over the fact that I have not bothered to learn French in six <laughs> years. <laughs> um, I, know, I know just enough to be dangerous. I know enough to order some food. Um, but yeah, so maybe I need it. a long train a long train ride and a tape. Or- ordering food and ordering drink is all you need. <laughs> I came to the, uh, the Dublin World Science Fiction Convention in 2019. Uh, and that's the first and so far only Worldcon in Ireland. And it was my first time that I'd visited Ireland on my new Irish passport. And and my friends in, in Dublin fandom were, were very welcoming. And, and a mate of mine came up to me and gave me a whole mouthful of Irish. And I don't really speak a word of it, but I know enough to like pick up, like, I think I got Gaelgo or Goilgo or something in there. And it, I guess that the gist was, so, you know, how's your command of the Irish language coming along? And I went... Uh, Promintia ale nemam czas, a nemam dost volnov mozek pro jiny jazyk. And, and I said, you know, I've been learning Czech for like eight years now, and, or well, not at that time, five years at that and, uh, and there's just no space in my brain to, to try and to do two languages at once. Try when you're younger, because my God, the yeah. older you get, the harder it gets. It really does. And, yeah. and these yeah. days, mm-hmm. just, just trying to process the volume of, of information I do every day is is pretty hard, yeah. But I I think having a lot of background knowledge and a lot of cynicism is helpful as well. <laughs> and and so when when companies talk about this wonderful new product they've invented, I can ask them, well, why aren't you using this identical product that was designed twenty years ago and did it in a tenth of the space? And occasionally they look at each other and go, um, we'd never heard of that. We'll go back and research that and check you check that out. <laughs> I guess the heartbreaking thing about Linux these days for me in, in the middle of the first half of the 21st century is a lot of the lessons of the past are being forgotten. And not only are people reinventing wheels badly, but they're, they're reinventing them in, in very un, un-Unix-like ways. Um, like, you know... Linux is a really astonishingly good implementation of an early 1970s style monolithic Unix. And and when young Linus Torvalds was just getting started, 
Andy Tannenbaum, the guy that wrote Minix, which was the operating system Torvalds used to, as, a, as a student, started a thread on Usenet called Linux is Obsolete. And, you know, it, 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 they just put out like version 0.01. But his point was it should be a microkernel. We know more about OS design now. Well, arguably, yes. But right around that time, the guys that wrote Unix were writing Plan 9. Plan 9 is Unix 2. Plan 9 is what Unix grew up to become. It's a network-aware, natively graphical Unix-like operating system. It's better in every meaningful way, but it's not compatible with Unix. But one of the things is, on Unix, when they say everything's a file, that's a cute little lie. It's it's not. No. Oh, yeah, everything's a file. What file is your IP address? What <laughs> file is the window at the top left of your console at the moment? Go on, <laughs> then. What file has got the length of your IP address reservation from DHCP in it. And these days there are things like slash proc, the slash proc file system, which has got a representation of all the processes in memory. That was taken from plan nine and, and implemented on Linux. Wayland is the hot new thing now in, in, in desktops. And I'm not a big fan of Wayland, but they're like, okay, you're building a new graphical interface for Unix. Everything's a file. Show me where my window is as a file in my file system then, Wayland guys. Because if it's not a file, is it really Unix? Because I thought everything was a file. And you know what GNOME is written in? GNOME Shell. Uh, off the top of my head, wouldn't have. Take a guess. C? C? C++? Yeah. You know, somewhere. Yeah. JavaScript. Oh. Oh, wow. It's implemented in JavaScript as a plugin for the Mutter window manager or compositor. Now, it's oh. getting them lots of contributions, but the idea of Unix was small compiled binaries that, that run you know, in, in an efficient way. What the acronym GNOME stood for was the GNU Network Object Model Environment, and they used this clumsy network object model because it used to involve the CORBA system for software objects to communicate over the network. That's long forgotten in modern GNOME. But the core ideas of Unix are things like make your program small, make it simple, make it take text input and emit text output so that programs can be joined together using pipes to build bigger systems. And now we have multi-megabyte lumps of JavaScript running in a jittered virtual machine None of this is, is to me, anything like the actual Unix philosophy of, of small, simple programs that do one thing and do it well. Why can't I take the taskbar from one desktop and the panel from the top of another desktop and the file manager from another desktop and the context menu handler so the right-click menu is provided by somebody else and put them all together into a desktop of my own choice? But you can't. You've got XFCE or Budgie or Mate, Mate, sorry, or Gnome or plasma they're all getting bigger and they're all getting more complicated and every now and again they fork and start to diverge so as well as kde plasma there's trinity and as well as gnome there's mate and yeah. work together solve yeah, these problems the X, together the old know? xkcd comic uh, there are now 15 standards mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> i i get your, your broader point but i think i, I just as you're talking about that i think is it Oh, Peppermint OS that um, hmm? uses mostly XFCE, but I think it uses the Nemo file system. Yeah, from, yeah, yeah. From, you from can, from file managers yeah. are one of the bits you can bring across. Yeah, I uh, I used to use um, Nemo in place of files on Ubuntu because I'm one of those very few people. I actually liked Unity. Much hated desktop. I think I still use Unity. I still like Unity. Not all my machines run Ubuntu, and if they don't, Unity by and large isn't an option. So the rest of them mostly run XFCE. But um, yeah, I, I used Unity for years and uh, usually used Nemo to, to, to do file stuff because the, the GNOME guys were busily ripping features out of Nautilus, including its name. So it's just files. Helpful. That, easy to Google that one. Yeah, great. Thanks. That ties a bit into one of our older questions, uh, which I was just going to say, because uh, simply, what do you use? You alluded to XFCE. Uh, do you have any particular base that you tend to go for? Uh, Debian, Ubuntu, um, Fedoras? Okay, my guilty confession, right now I'm talking to you from a Mac, and that's because I, I work from home and have done for full-time for about the last three four years no four years another reason why mike would like you <laughs> <laughs> but this is a mac with 
So I have an Apple account because I worked with Max in my first job. I've been working with Max since the 80s. I have an Apple account because I used to post questions on their support forums in the 90s. There's no payment method on my Apple account because they didn't have payment methods when I opened an Apple account. And a few bits of the Apple ecosystem these days crash when I sign in because all those database records are empty. And I'm not adding one because this Mac runs almost entirely open source. And if it's not open source, it's freeware. I think the only Apple tool I ever occasionally use is, well, now it's called music for, for playing MP3s. I, I use Firefox and Thunderbird and messaging app called uh, Ferdy and Signal and Telegram and Panwriter and LibreOffice. And there's there's virtually no Apple software on here. And I can't buy any, which suits me fine. I don't have an iPhone. I don't have an Apple Watch. I don't have any of the halo effect. My laptops all run, all, all my more modern ones run Ubuntu with Unity if they are machines I work on. But I'm in the process of moving my main travel machine to MX Linux these days. Oh, interesting. Okay. Because it's got an NVIDIA graphics chip in it. I can't replace it. I can't upgrade it. And it's not mm. supported past kernel 6.5. And you can't readily block Ubuntu from upgrading your kernel. I've, I've made it run the kernel that shipped with 2204 because they upgraded my kernel every six months and my NVIDIA drivers stopped working. And I logged a bug and they went, upstream problem, nothing we can do about it. So I'm moving to MX Linux now with XFCE because it's smaller and quicker and does everything I need. Personally, I prefer AppImage to either Snap or Flatpak, although given the choice of Snap or Flatpak, I'd prefer Snap because I understand how it works. In both Red Hat and SUSE, I had to use Git for my day job. I hate Git. It's a <laughs> phenomenally complicated tool, very hard work. And again, there's an XKCD about this, although I don't remember which number. You know, and, and, <laughs> and what happens if you make a change and you want to go back? I don't know. Save your work somewhere else, delete your directory, and clone it again from GitHub. And that's what almost everybody actually does. <laughs> Under the hood, Flatpak uses a thing called OS tree to distribute binaries. OS tree is Git for binaries. And I bet that of all the Flatpak users and advocates in the world, I reckon the number of them that could actually explain how it synchronizes binaries from their server onto your computer, I seriously reckon that I could count them on my fingers. Mm -hmm. It's really complicated. Very few people actually understand it. You've probably got to be as smart as Linus Torvalds to un understand how it works. And Snap, here's a squash FS. You mount it and you run the program from in there. It's simple. I understand it. That's good. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. A lot of the weenies will go, oh, but the Snap store isn't open. No, but you don't need to use the Snap store. They provide you with all the tools and fully document how you set up your own store and you can distribute your own binaries. And I've spoken with large Ubuntu corporate customers who run their own Snap store to distribute Snaps to their machines. They don't use the canonical one at all. The canonical one's closed source, but you can run your own. And the flat pack weenies go, oh, but flat hub's open. Yeah, great. But, you know, you don't need canonical source code. You don't need a fancy back end like flat pack because all you've got to do is copy a single file. That's snap. It's much, much easier. I, li I like simple things that work and I can understand how they work. And if the implementation method or the tools or the protocols are really complicated and I don't understand them, that makes me nervous of working with them. And I feel that part of the core principles of open source should be that you can take it apart and understand it. And there's an awful lot of stuff out there now that you can't. There was a talk at the Open Source Summit in Bilbao last year where a young guy tried to explain why OS Tree was a wonderful way to provision machines over the network. And the slides where he tried to explain how OS Tree work would turn your hair white. They were It's so complicated. La layers of virtual file systems, which are software defined and are nothing to do with any Unix file system. It's great big directories with hexadecimal hashes that are automatically synchronized over a proprietary protocol. And like, <laughs> like, is it so hard to like copy a tarball and tar minus XVF? You know, it's like, no, it's... <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I like Ubuntu. I'm I, Deb Debian... Particularly since they adopted systemd, I'm not such a big fan. 
it makes stuff unnecessarily hard. But if I had to run a server, I probably would. Devuan, they don't, to me, seem to be really trying to improve over Debian. They're defined by what they're not, Debian with systemd taken out. Yeah. I've professionally worked with Red Hat tools, and I was working with Red Hat before Fedora existed. I remember the horror of installing KDE2 with RPM, over 200 dependencies, and you had to manually find them all yourself, download them all yourself, and install them in the right order to get the program installed. It was about two days' work. Not a huge fan of, of their tools, their, their suite. I've played with Arch. I've been playing with Arch since it was quite new. I, I like it, but it doesn't do anything I desperately want. My favorite distro I want to know better is Alpine at the moment. Alpine Linux is a thing of beauty, but it's a bit scary. And uh, as you as you rattling off the the one that um, is on a lot of podcast uh, minds at, at the moment, even though it's not exactly something new, is NixOS. Have, have you have you st- I, dabbled anything? Yeah, with I, I I attempted to review it, and uh, a, a couple of people sent me very nice feedback on that. I think it's very very clever and very elegant, and it answers a problem that I personally don't have. But a friend of mine uses it, and what he does. So I I still have many friends I made while I was at Red Hat. Uh, socially speaking, it was a lovely and a great work environment. It's quite common amongst Red Hat and ex-Red Hat people to maintain your own Ansible playbook. And when you get a new computer, you put Ansible on it and you run your playbook and it installs all your apps for you. Well, my friends who use Nix do that as well, except that they've distilled this down to like one line of Nix code, which sucks in one little text file that they maintain and they run a single command and it deploys a complete ready-to-use Linux computer with every tool they want, with all the settings they want, in a single operation, and also optionally updates it. And then every now and again, you just, you know, if your requirements change, you nuke it and re-image it. It's, it's a step up from the, the, the Red Hat model of, like, install your OS and then run Ansible to configure it your way. Like, I'd simplify that down to one operation. I, 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 my, my wife feels I have way too many elderly think pads around the house and she may have a point but <laughs> they are also my working tools you know they're what i test distros on and so on but i don't need to deploy my workstation frequently thanks <laughs> i guess the simplicity but you're to your point it's it's solving a problem that i don't appear to have uh, i'm sure if if a uh, push came to show uh, to shove and i had the desire to Within a weekend, I could probably go through the, the learning pains of going, right, how do I install it? What are, how do I install software? After a couple of days, I setting aside a weekend, I'm sure I would have uh, f- uh, figured it out. But I'm like, do I need to? When mm-hmm. I can just download an ISO, burn it to a USB stick, install, and I know how to do that. Well, yeah. But it's it's... The big biggest thing is package management. It's just, I'm used to... um. I'm one of those people who are like, I like a GUI tool. So mm-hmm. for me, it's it's running, it's KDE, so it's, it's KDE Discover. Mm-hmm. Uh, my interpretation or, or or what I've been led to believe is just, you can't, on NixOS, you can't just run, like, open up KDE Discover and, like, start search, searching for packages and just click install. It's it's all just on your on your config file. Yeah, kind of yes and no. I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't claim I understood it very well, but it's more like, you know, it's it's kind of like saying, well, I've I've got this beautiful Tesla car. I, I do not. I they, mm. they don't pay me enough. But <laughs> but how how do I pedal it? What? <laughs> well, you don't pedal it. Well, I need to pedal it. What if the battery's flat? How do I pedal uphill to the charging point? You don't you don't pedal it. You can't pedal it. Okay, how do I push it? Well, you can't push it either because it weighs three tons. Well, 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 that's no use then. You know, it's like. Nix kind of transcends the idea of package managers and mm. just installing something by you have one elegant little script in their in their own strange but fully declarative language and and it will do all that for you. But yeah, you can type a command and install a program, but yeah, they they've tried to transcend the whole issue. I mean, I I'm I met the um I met the CTO of a company called Flox, who who sell a, a solution based on on Nix um, at Fosdem a couple of years ago, and and he's a man of my own age, and he came up 
more more hardcore Unix than me because I spent a lot of my earlier career working with Windows. But he worked on Solaris and AIX and the big commercial proprietary Unixes. And 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 he said, you know, after after thirty thirty years of managing Unix boxes, I discovered Nix and went, oh, we've been doing software distribution on Unix wrong all this time. And I loved that summary. You know, he he he, cap- he encapsulated it in a completely non technical sentence. After you know. 30 years with both proprietary systems and all the BSDs and Linux. And he went, oh, this is how it should be done. Of course. Right. Oh, sorry. But yeah, it, I don't personally have a need for that. And I don't really have enough of a need to spend the time to learn it. You know what? If there is a, a future of, of Linux on the on the desktop in mass penetration, I think it's going to be something akin to Chrome OS with snaps. I think it's going to be something very simple and highly automated where you don't have a package manager, you don't have root, you do not get to choose how big your disk partitions are or whatever. It does that for you. And packages will be a file that just magically runs and integrates and the operating system can take care of updating it. Does the new one work? If yes, remove the one before the one before last my wife's laptop is running chromos flex and previous to that i gave her an old macbook she'd pretty much only ever seen windows before i was able to show her how to navigate mac os and she was able to you know browse the web do her email make skype calls to her mom that that kind of thing that was easy enough but it does all this other stuff that she has no need for and chrome os you get a web browser it's kind of all she needs. That's a very good point. That's it's so it's so easy to refer, to forget in in our world as well that the the general public they don't care what's mm-hmm. on the computer. They just want it to work. They just mm-hmm. want to go on the internet. They want to watch YouTube. They want to look at Instagram. They want to send an email. We're we're hobbyists. We're enthusiasts. Mm-hmm. We're 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 the people who like to tinker. And we're we're in like probably the the top. 0.5 of a percent of yeah. people who give this much of a shit about any <laughs> yeah. of these things. <laughs> Chrome, Chrome OS is a Linux. It's it's a much more ordinary Linux than Android, and it just works. It's it's grand. A great example of this is the Steam Deck. Yeah. We know that it runs Linux. Do you think uh, 95% of the people who buy um, the Steam Deck know or care that exactly. it runs Linux? They don't know, and they shouldn't have to. I, I mean, the thing I liked, like, so I... I uh, once we came over here, we actually, we forgot my wife's MacBook, but we, we had to do an international move and there was only so much stuff we could bring. We went back and had a look for it in the in my locked up cellar in, in Prague and we couldn't find it. There's a lot in there and about half of it is old sci-fi books and much of the rest is old computers. So what I did is I hackintoshed an old PC. I connected it to my little NAS server and restored the last time machine backup of her MacBook copied all of her stuff onto a USB key, and well, two for safety. Then I nuked the Hackintosh and made it into a Chrome OS machine and copied her files back. And it worked flawlessly. It boots much quicker in Chrome OS, and it can drive an external monitor, and it can talk to Bluetooth and link to her phone and stuff. You know, it's it's not crippled. She watches... We, one of our shared fondnesses is, is animated movies and, and, and cartoons. And she had a bunch of, of Pixar and classic Asterix and stuff, but she's got it in check. And Chrome OS doesn't have a video player. So oh. I popped a Linux console. It's the same keystroke as on Ubuntu, Control-Alt-T. Mm-hmm. That gives you a Debian session. I did apt sudo apt update apt install VLC. Then I closed the prompt and I opened a file window and I clicked on one of the movies and it just played. So real Chromebook, you can run Android stuff, but on Chrome OS Flex, you've got Debian underneath. It's not Debian based, but there's a little Debian container. And yeah, it, I, I didn't have to do any integration. I just installed VLC and clicked on a movie file in Chrome OS and it just opened and played. No bother. So, you know, if you do have a little bit of a clue and it won't do something that you might reasonably want to do locally, like play a video, it was literally like two commands to fix that. And and it just worked. And that's kind of how computers should be, I think. You mentioned sci-fi books. I'm curious. Uh, what, are, what are you on at the moment in terms of sci-fi? Uh, right now, I have just started a new trilogy by Ken McLeod, 
who is a wonderful, wonderful Scots sci-fi writer and was a close friend of the late, great Ian Banks. Ah, one of my favorites. Yeah. And I know Ken slightly. I have a picture of him looking a bit confused at this year's EasterCon because my little daughter, who's four, came with me to the British National Sci-Fi Convention at Easter, and she brought the class teddy bear with her. And Bradley Bear was meant to have some adventures. So I've got a photo of <laughs> bemused Ken McLeod holding a teddy bear going, what? <laughs> there you go. Bradley Bear met a famous sci-fi writer. Uh, Ken's a brilliant writer. The book is called, I think, Beyond the Light Horizon. So far, it's mm. a, I'm, I'm very confused, but it's I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Previous one to that was Greg Egan, Australian writer of very info-dense novels. Highly, highly recommend Egan, particularly good at short story length. His collection Axiomatic is magnificent. I think it's only got about 10 stories in it, and I'd say at least two or three of them are among the best sci-fi short stories ever written by anybody wow. in any language. Learning to be me is 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 a towering classic. Ted Chiang is also fantastic. I bumped into Ted Chiang at the World Fantasy Con about 11 years ago, and for once I was struck dumb. I, I just I just wanted to fanboy squee and I couldn't. I heard about Ted Chang. Uh, that's the guy who wrote the story that Arrival was right. based on. Yeah, much better uh, as a short story. Much better. They put in some extra yeah. explosions and a war. They put in a war. <laughs> it didn't need a war. Um, but the core <laughs> the core of story of your life is the name of the story. Is mm. how the aliens write and the screen ad- adaptation. They they didn't get that. So the aliens kind of spray paint their language. As a, yeah. as a single sentence. And it's like the whole point is the order they write it in. That's the key plot point, And they missed it. But lovely film. I mean, I enjoyed it a lot. Do you actually read physical books or are you an ebook reader? I do. I, I, so yeah, my, you know, if, if we, if I was still in my front room in Prague, when, when I started doing zoom calls, you know, in, in the early lockdowns, um, people went, that's a good backdrop. You've got there, Liam. Like, that's not a backdrop. <laughs> Those are the nonfiction shelves. <laughs> 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 On my side, I'm currently on um, I'm currently on the Revelation Space trilogy by oh, uh, Alistair cool. Reynolds. Yeah, um, it's fantastic. They are they're a bit depressing, I find, in places. Uh, yeah, characters are very mean. Yeah, a lot of the time, there's, there's not there's not many <laughs> you know very sympathetic people. But <laughs> so I, I still read quite a lot of sci-fi. I do I do like physical books. I've got a Kindle, and I almost never use it. I'm the exact same. I, I've used the Kindle for things that I've reread a lot. So my Kindle has quite a lot of Pratchett and Douglas Adams and Kim Stanley Robinson books that I, I like to reread frequently. And, uh, you know, carry, carrying around 50 books in case you want to read one of them again is a bit inconvenient. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, it's a good place to wrap things up. Liam, uh, before we go, is there anything you would like to shout out, like a, a personal website or your social media presence or anything like that or anything you want to tell people read the register it's great uh yeah no www.theregister.com i do have a tech blog it's uh liam dash on dash linux dot dreamwit dot org um but it doesn't get very much content on it these days because to be honest i spend you know nine to five monday to friday writing and and the last thing i want to do when i knock off work is do a bit more writing usually It does get some occasional posts. Um, I, I set it up because I got a book deal about 20 odd years ago to write a manual to set up an Ubuntu server, but they never paid me the advance. So I never finished the book. But um, you can trace some of my technical interests over the years in the post on that. There's not been that many. There's probably only a few a year. You know, I, I was very, very interested in the Lisp programming language for years, which is one of the things that spoke to me about Lisp is probably the most powerful programming language ever created by by humanity thus far, and once had its whole own family of operating systems written entirely in Lisp, which a bunch of the fans wrote a book compiled from mailing list posts called the Unix Haters Handbook. (laughs) And I really recommend that. It's out there for free. Some of the info, some of the stuff in it with these Lisp guys bitching about Unix is horribly, horribly dated and, and out of date now. But you know what? About three quarters of it is still absolutely on the nail. And I really think that everybody involved in professional 
or you know serious hobby project development on Unix, on Linux, FreeBSD, all of them need to read the Unix Haters Handbook. It's it's a very funny book. It's got cartoons. It's very accessible. Um, I'm I'm talking to the guy who wrote the chapter on X11 about a possible interview for the Reg. He's he's still around. Uh, he's he's a great laugh. He's a bit of an old hippie <laughs> and a fascinating guy. And I uh, I quoted him in a recent article and I, I messaged him for a, a comment. And I said to my editor, it might take him a while to reply, but when he replies, Don's going to send me about 20 links, which will point to about 10,000 words of material. And sure enough, a couple of hours later, I got an email with, with you know, enough for a, a fairly big book worth of reference material on his proposal for replacing Wayland is an embedded JavaScript server running on your GPU. And we should all write JavaScript that talks directly. The imaging model is JavaScript and the web imaging model, because that's everybody's native imaging model now. But mm. you know what? He's a phenomenally smart guy, and he's probably right. I'm not sure if anybody will do it, and I'm very confident nobody's going to listen to him because, you know, he's old. <laughs> That's always the way. Read the Unix Haters Handbook, but mainly read the register. There you go. That'll do. <laughs> so there you go. You have yeah. plenty of recommendations there, dear, dear listeners. As for our own socials, you can go to linuxlads.com forward slash contact. You can email us and show at Linux Lads. Um, we're most active in our Telegram group, which is linuxlads.com forward slash Telegram. Um, and if you don't like the Telegram, we're also on Matrix, which is bridged to the Telegram. I just wanted to shout out uh, a couple of events. Dublin Maker is happening uh, on 31st of August and Sunday 1st of September. So Saturday 31st of August, I should say, and Sunday 1st of September in uh, Richmond Barracks in Dublin ourselves have actually exhibited there before um many years ago uh but uh, i would thoroughly recommend you go along it's fantastic if you're any kind of a nerd or a hacker or a maker go along there's going to be something you'll enjoy there so uh that's uh that's definitely a great weekend out i'm a member of our local hacker space which are involved in running that event so um i will definitely be about there so at some point so uh Feel free to say hello if you even recognize me, because I don't know if anyone knows what I even look like. But <laughs> um, so, uh, particularly without the beard now. Yeah, well, I'm starting to grow it back a little bit, as you can see. <laughs> uh, I kind, I kind of missed it, you know. Um, look for the porn star stash. Uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's what's in now. That's what's in <laughs> the, the, the seventies porn star stash. I had, uh, I had a full lumberjack beard for about ten years. Oh, you, you did indeed. Yeah. I had a proper big old big old beard uh and i do miss it from time to time but it you know once you shave it it takes about 10 years off your face mm. <laughs> uh the other one i wanted to shout out briefly is uh og camp so that's happening in manchester on the 12th and 13th of october 2024 thoroughly recommend that um so go to ogcamp.org for more information i did forget to say the website for dublin maker it's dublinmaker.ie so um go along there for more information so uh, lots of events. It's great. The post-event times are, you know, we actually have events to go to now, which is fantastic. So thank you very much for listening again. And thanks again to Liam for coming along. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been fun. Uh, fantastic discussion. Really interesting. Really fun. Very much indeed. Yeah. So uh, that's it from us. Uh, you'll see us again in two weeks. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>